Good morning. So it's the first Sabbath of a new year. And you might think, well, he's going to talk about resolutions. But that's not the case. I don't like to be a quitter. I don't usually make them. And I think anything worth doing is worth doing now. And I don't always do good at that either. If resolutions work for you, then keep making them. Somebody in my closeness called them revolutions, and maybe that would be a better thing, to change our lives revolutionary. How many of you are interested in prophecy? As Adventists, it's kind of in our blood. I'm interested in it, but I don't spend huge amounts of time studying it and trying to understand it. But recently I listened to a series called Back to the Basics by Ivor Myers. And for me it was a good reminder. And there were some things I learned in there that maybe I hadn't thought of before. And in that section, you know, this is a plethora of messages from this guy. There's a sex section called The Elephant in the Room. And well, sometimes hard to listen to, it made me think. So I invite you to check that out. If you don't, that's up to you. So why am I telling you that I spent this great time listening to this man speak? Because this world grabs our attention often, and we get caught up on the wrong things. And recently, I found myself in that place, paying attention to what's going on out there far too much than what's going on in here and up there. I'm not saying we shouldn't pay attention to what's going on in the world around us. It affects us. It makes choices that we don't sometimes have any ability to change. So it's worth giving attention to. But sometimes we get caught up in it so much more than we expect. And we start to see things that maybe we didn't once think of. Ivor Myers says it this way, we get caught up in the world's remixes when talking about prophecy and the way the world lays it out sometimes. He's remixing the things that we believe, and we get a little caught off guard, and we start believing things that we once did not. So part of listening to all of this has has done something for me. It's it's renewed a, a a lost passion a bit that I had. And I invite you to find those things in your own life things that help draw you back to God constantly, to look at him in new eyes, to see him as beautiful as he really is, and it's ever-changing. We have eternity to see him for who he truly is. So as we start this morning, I invite you to pray with me one more time that God will open my heart and my mind as well as yours. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for those who came before me this morning preparing a way with the words they've said, the songs they've sang. Lord, if you can keep us in that place with the messages they've already bring as we listen to what you have to say this morning, I just pray that our hearts will be open to you, that our ears will hear, that the words I have to say will... um, make people think, and that you will do the work from there. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So like I said, prophecy. We're going to start in Daniel 2, 
and I am in no way prepared to teach prophecy. So what I might be doing this morning, we could call prophecy light. Not just basic, but light. While you're finding Jan Daniel chapter 2, I'm going to remind you of the story a little bit so we don't have to read it all. King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of, Neb of Babylon, is having an, a night terror. And he wakes up, he can't remember any of it. So he calls all those in his kingdom that should be able to help him with this problem. His magicians, his astrologers, sorcerers, Chaldeans, the wise men of Babylon. He calls them to his palace. Tell me this dream I had, he says. And they already are struggling. He says, I will give you anything you want. But you need to tell me what I dreamt. Oh, king, the thing you're asking, uh, it's impossible. Mm, you're just trying to buy time, he says. You need to tell me what my dream is or things are going to change around here. They're unable to do what he's asking, and so he sends out a decree. Go forth and kill all these men. They've been deceiving me this whole time. So his soldiers go forth, and Arioch, the captain of the guard, comes to Daniel, and, is, and Daniel says, what is this big hurry that you're in? What is this that you're doing? Why is the king in such a panic? Why is he doing this to his people? Arioch explains to them that the king wants to know a dream that he had, and Daniel says, I don't know that dream, but give me time, and we'll... We'll figure it out. And so he goes before the king and tells the king the same. And he has a day. So Daniel goes home to his friends, explains the situation, and they have a time of prayer. And in that time of prayer, the dream is revealed to Daniel. And so he goes forth to see the king. And we'll pick up the story in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 27. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, The secret which the king has demanded, the wise men and astrologers and magicians and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. But there is a God in heaven who reveals secrets, and he has made known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream, the vision that was on your head upon your bed, were these. As you, O king, Thoughts came to your mind while you were in your bed about what would come to pass after this. And he who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. But as for me, this secret has not been revealed to me because I have more wisdom than anyone living. But for our sakes, who make known the interpretation to the king, that you may know the thoughts of your heart. O king, we're watching, you, O king, we're watching, and behold a great image. The great image whose splendor was excellent stood before you, and his form was awesome. This image was, a he, image, image's head was that of fine gold, and the chest and arms of silver, and his belly and thighs of bronze, its legs and iron, and its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. You watched while a stone was cut out without hands, which struck the image in its feet of iron and clay, and broke them into pieces. Then the iron and the clay and the bronze and the silver and the gold were crushed together and becoming like chaff from the summer threshing floors, the wind carried them away so that no trace of them was found. And the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream. Now we will tell you the interpretation of it before the king. You, O king, are the king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you the kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And and wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field and the birds of the heaven, he has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over all of them. You are the head of gold. But after you shall arise another kingdom inferior to yours, then in a third kingdom of bronze, which shall rule over the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, as much as iron breaks into pieces and shatters everything. And like iron that crushes 
that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Whereas you saw the feet and toes partly of potter's clay and partly of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, yet the strength and iron shall be in it, just as you saw the iron mixed with ceramic clay. And as the toes of the feet were partly of iron and partly of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly fragile, as you saw iron mixed with ceramic clay. They will mingle with the seed of men, but they will not adhere to one another, just as the iron does not mix with clay. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which has never been destroyed. The kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break into pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. As much as you saw that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and in that broke into pieces the iron and the bronze and the clay and the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. And the dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. And we often come here, and we should be fairly familiar with this story. And we use it to show that God can predict what's going to happen. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Daniel 5, Daniel lives into Medo-Persia. Darius the Mede comes, and history bears out the rest. And sometimes we go on beyond that, and rightly so, for God has given us a, a message so we know what's going to happen in this world and that we can depend on him. But we sometimes forget about this little kingdom that's cut without hands and becomes a great mountain and is not given to another people, but is forever and forever. So I want to draw your attention to, to that kingdom today. In today's world, I get the sense that this perfect kingdom is believed to come only through human hands. But it doesn't seem to be the case. You also might be saying to yourself, well, this seems kind of harsh, this kingdom coming and destroying all the others. But we'll get a chance to look at that. So let's see how the Bible describes these two kingdoms. We'll start with the kingdom of earth. Now, as I'm thinking about this whole kingdom thing, and recently I spent time in the last, I don't know, months, thinking about the two kinds of people that are there at the end and what they look like and how they act. So you might want to buckle up your seatbelts a little here because when you look, when you just search the kingdom of heaven and you find little verses that, hey, this works for you, and then you actually read the context, things sometimes get painful. So let's look at the kingdom of the earth. Come with me to 2 Timothy, chapter 3. We're going to read some scripture this morning. Second Timothy, chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. But know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. For when will we be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God having a form of godliness, but, not, but, not, but denying its power. I don't know about you, but as I grew up thinking, I don't know, of the end times and how perilous it seems, I felt like there were, the remedy for that wasn't always given. And we'll get there this morning. I, I hope that you'll come there with me in thought. 
But I don't know if you noticed, there's this list of all these things, and we're like, well, those aren't good. But it says, having a form of godliness, but not denying its power. I think Alton uses the New Living Translation. And it says in there, that last verse, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. I might be misunderstanding this, but it seems like this is talking about people who believe in God. They're acting a certain way, but they're denying the power that could change them. So we have a list developing about what this kingdom of earth looks like. Come with me to 1 Corinthians chapter, one, chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And like we sometimes do, I'm going to jump right in the middle of the mess, and then we'll figure it out from there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I'm going to read you verses 9 and 10. Do you not know that the unrighteousness will not, unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters nor adult, idolaters nor adulterers nor homosexuals nor sodomites nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunken, nor revilers, nor extortionists will inherit the kingdom of God. It sounds pretty painful. But if you read the context of that, the whole section is my Bible has broken it down, verses 1 through 11. Once again, he's talking about these people that seem to be following God. Verse 1, dare any of you having a matter against another go to the law before the unrighteous and do before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will judge, be judged by you and unworthy to judge this, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If you, having judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do not appoint those who are uh, appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge, I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one who will be able to judge between his brethren? But but brother goes to the law against brother, and before unbelievers. So what is he saying? He's saying there's two believers who can't even go to a third believer to get things straightened out. They have contentions against each other. But they take their matter to somebody who doesn't even believe the same way they do. Because they can't get along. Now therefore it is already, verse 7, Now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do these things to your brethren. Do you not know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not deceive neither do not be deceived, neither fornicators nor idolaters? No, we went through that. Verse eleven. And such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Sometimes we look at these lists and we say, well, that's, man, at least that's not me. But if we have contentions with each other, we fall in the same list. But we've been justified, sanctified. We've been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Galatians chapter 5, as we continue to paint this picture. Galatians chapter 5.
once again, one of these places where we could just jump right in and make a mess of it. So I'm going to start in verse 16 and give some context. I say, they, I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, rivalries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Paul's writing to the, to the Galatians. And his greatest, at least the way I understand it, the point he's trying to get to the, across to them is they've turned back to trying to be righteous by the law. And he's saying the law was a tutor to bring you to the point where you knew that you needed something more than just the understanding of the law. The law is good. It brings you to realize that you need more help. You can't do this on your own. And sometimes we look at these lists of things again. And we say, well, that's not me. I don't do these things. At least I'm not like that. But we've made a list, and I got ahead of myself momentarily, so we have to back up a second. We've made a list. Of, of things. Imagine a world dominated by the desires, by these guys, desires continuously. A kingdom of this world. Fear, manipulation, control, dominion, selfishness, me over you. We don't have to imagine too hard. I mean, we do live in that world. but a world where that is the thoughts continuously. But sometimes we just look at those lists and we say, well, at least I don't do that. But the kingdom of God is more than not doing. It's not a, re a religion, a, a practice of not doing. It's a, a practice of doing some of the other things. And so, Galatians continues on in, in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Sometimes we want to keep the law, and the law oftentimes just says, don't do this. There's a few where it says, do this. But most of it is like, don't do this. And we figure that's good enough. I've heard uh, a pastor say, even dead people can keep the law. They're not doing anything. But there's still other things to be done than not doing. So let's build a picture of that. Here in Galatians 5, we have love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Come with me to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14 and verse 17. Verse 17. For the kingdom of God is not eating or drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Second Peter chapter one. Once again, trying to paint a picture. Second Peter chapter one. 
5 through 11 reads, But also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound in you, will abound, will you be neither barren nor unfruitful to the knowledge of your Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be ever more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior. Jesus Christ. Come with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28. Therefore, since we, have re- we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken, let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. And if we're talking about the kingdom of God, we can't leave out 1 Corinthians chapter 13 which describes love and God is love. I'm going to read verses 4 through 7. Love suffers long and is, is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. It does not have behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. And finally, Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to read verses... 9 through 18, Colossians 1. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. Strengthened with all might according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and covered us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through the, his blood and forgiveness of our sins. Now imagine this, living in a world where our heart's desire continually is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, righteousness, truth, hope, forgiveness, mercy, grace, virtue, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, And imagine the king that rules such a place. Weigh those two out. This kingdom isn't some day out there in the future. 
In Luke chapter 17, 20 to 21. I have to actually go there and read it. I didn't write it down. Luke chapter 17, 20 and 21. So the Pharisees come to Jesus says, now when, the, when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation, nor will they say, see over here or see over there, for indeed the kingdom of God is within you. This kingdom that we just painted out in a picture of words, this is within you today. It's not some future thing just someday when, when Jesus comes again that will be made like that that will be the desires of our heart in that day it is in the heart of the believers and through Jesus we can see what that kingdom looks like do not be deceived. This kingdom is not to be found among the kingdoms of the earth. As I was thinking about these things, I was reminded of a story that we read by our kids when they were younger called The Little Pilgrim's Progress. I don't know if you've ever read the book, The Pilgrim's Progress. Um, I'd almost recommend The Little Pilgrim's Progress more. I listened to the Pilgrim's Progress this last week, and while it's good, I think there's better word pictures produced by the little Pilgrim's Progress. If you're a reader, it won't take you long. If you're a listener, give six hours of your life to YouTube and you can hear it yourself. It's worth listening to. See, it tells the story of this person who's left the kingdom of this earth and is headed for a kingdom that is more beautiful than you can imagine. But he makes mistakes and falls along the way. There's people who are trying to get him off the path that he's been set forth into. And there's others who bring him back to the path that will get him to that kingdom. We're all like that. We all go astray. We all backslide. We all make mistakes. But if we really desire that kingdom, he will produce it in us. And sometimes we talk about those last days, and they seem so perilous. They seem so undesirable. But the Bible teaches that in those last days, when the world is dominated by wickedness, every intent and thought of the heart is only evil continually, that there will be a people that live for an everlasting kingdom of love, empowered by the Holy Spirit and faith of Jesus Christ, a kingdom in which righteousness dwells. I want to be part of that kingdom. How about you? So throughout this next year, become more familiar with the kingdom of God or heaven. I only brushed on the verses. Jesus came proclaiming the kingdom of heaven is now. He has plenty to say about the kingdom. He has plenty to show you in his actions what the kingdom looks like. Celebrate the principles of the kingdom that you see in this world. Strive to desire and live by them through the power of Jesus. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And finally, Romans chapter 12, 2. 
And I think the last song we sang really encapsulates this. I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation because Romans 12.2, uh, New Living Translation pretty well puts it straight. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is the good and pleasing and perfect. There's always been a people that lived by the kingdom of God. Otherwise, we wouldn't have these stories. That's why they exist. The disciples, while afraid, they're in the upper room after Jesus has been taken, change into people that, even though their lives were being torn apart, counted it all joy. There was people who, in the dark ages, still believed in God and wanted to follow his ways. They sang songs of praise as they burnt at the stake. There will be a group of people who will live with love for those around them who are treating them unimaginably. I want to be part of those people. I pray you do too. Pray with me this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we just pray that we can see your kingdom, that we won't get tied up in the kingdoms of this world. We won't be deceived to think that what we think is good is Not good. I don't know how else to say that. Lord, I just pray that we will see your kingdom and your word. We'll see you living it out. That we will desire to copy that, to be more like you in this world. That we can shine forth your love, your patience, your kindness, your love, your mercy into this world. And that your kingdom can come in each and every one of us. And then when you do come back, that there is a people living for your kingdom. Help us to see, see it in this world and see it in others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.